thanks. Thank you. Take it away. Thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, wow, wow, there's more of you up there than down here. Uh, I'm going to start this um, with a heartfelt sentiment. I love this movie and the reason that I do is not necessarily because it is fact-filled. It is actually uh, a cherry-picking of the files of Ed and Lorraine Warren and the information that my family uh, provided to the producers. And what they did was they took our story and Lorraine and Ed's story and they created their own third story. And the reason that they did that was because it would be virtually impossible to compress 10 years into two hours. And the other part of that is that Hollywood, or as I like to call it, Holly Weird, um, doesn't trust you. And that's not their fault. They're just going on past experience. But they thought that if they told the true story, that it would literally run you out of the theater. And that's why you got a toned down version called The Conjuring. <laughs> when I tell you that the truth is stranger than fiction, that's an understatement of the new millennium. It took me seven years and three books, uh, volume one, two, and three of House of Darkness, House of Light, to tell our whole true story. And it's not exclusively a horror story. It is essentially a love story. Now this is what The Conjuring got right. Good conquers evil. Love conquers fear. The Perrin family endured an extreme haunting that they all survived. That's the impression that The Conjuring leaves. There are many elements of the film that are what I call the cosmic kisses. The things about the movie that the producers, the director, the cast, the crew, the set designer could not possibly have known about, even though they read the books. There were things in the, book, in, in the film that were not in the books. Sadie, the death of the dog as soon as we moved to the farm. I didn't put it in the books because I thought that it was so sad and the way that he died was so terrible that I didn't want to turn my readers away and go, oh, this is just too morose, I can't deal with this. And still, after 40 years, I couldn't write about it because it was such a terrible thing that happened right after we moved to the farm. There are things in this film, if, think back on what you just saw. There are things in this film that appeared, almost magically appeared. I couldn't believe it when I was sitting with Lorraine Warren and my sister Cindy three months before the film opened in July of 2013. And Warner Brothers had graciously invited us out to Hollywood to have a private screening of the film prior to its premiere. And when the camera rounded the corner into my bedroom and the young lady that played me in the film was Shanley Caswell, lovely person, wonderful young lady. When they rounded the camera into my room and I saw the folk art drawing of the white cat, that exact duplicate of a picture is hanging in my office in my home in Winter Garden, Florida. It was given to me when I was 13 years old by my mother's friend, Fran. We were out at a flea market in Foster, Rhode Island, which is just one town over from where we lived. And I saw it and I fell madly in love with it. And it was 50 cents and my mom didn't have 50 cents to buy it for me. And it was the weekend of my birthday and Fran bought it for me. That exact picture is hanging in my office. Nobody involved with The Conjuring knew anything about that. There are 25,000 different 
prints of wallpaper available on the open market. They chose the exact print that we had in the farmhouse. None of them had ever seen a photograph of the inside of the farm. In fact, the only photographs of our family, which are in the film, are at the very end when my mom and my dad and my sisters had our pictures taken. We took each other's pictures uh, the Easter before we moved to the farm. And I sent those out to Hollywood with the promise that they would send the originals back after they reworked them and framed them for the film. The uh, wind chimes that Cindy goes running through the house with to hang on the porch, identical to the set of wind chimes that we had hanging on our front porch. They didn't know that. They couldn't possibly have known that. <sighs> However, when Ed and Lorraine Warren came to our home for the first time, it wasn't 1971, it was the night before Halloween in 1973. We had already been there for quite some time. We had already gone through some really remarkable and very frightening things. The reason that they came to the house was not because my mother sought them out. She had no idea who they were when they showed up at our kitchen door at about 7 o'clock in the evening and it was already pitch dark and it was freezing outside and my very gracious mother invited these apparently harmless people into our home. The only reason that they knew about us was because a young man two months earlier showed up in our yard in a uh, VW van, you know, like hippie style, remember anybody old enough to remember the old VW vans? And, uh, and he and his team uh, came from Rhode Island College. Their group's name, uh, the acronym was PIRO, P-I-R-O. And he said, his name is Keith Johnson, and he said he had received a phone call from my mother asking him to come help us. My mother never called anyone, but someone did. And when he walked into the house, he had an experience that was so profound and so disturbing that he is the one that set out to contact Ed and Lorraine Warren on our behalf. And the reason that they waited to come to the house just prior to Halloween was because they were mistakenly thinking that that would be their very best chance to see some type of manifestation in our home. Um, they thought that there was a veil. There is no veil. The spirit world is part of our world. Our world is part of the spirit world. And the only reason that we perceive that there is a veil is because it keeps us relegated and safe in a three-dimensional, five-sensory realm. But that is not the truth of our existence. We live in a multi-dimensional, multi-sensory universe. And our home was a portal, very cleverly disguised as a farmhouse. There were over a dozen spirits that we dwelled with, and we had to learn to live with the dead. The reason that Bathsheba copped all the blame in The Conjuring was because the night that Lorraine and Ed walked into our kitchen for the first time, she walked over to our big black stove and she placed her hand on the corner and she covered her eyes and she said, I sense a malignant presence in this house. Her name is Bathsheba. Now to Lorraine's credit, she couldn't possibly have known that there was a history with Bathsheba Sherman and our farm. Although she was not an Arnold and she never lived in the house, the story that the local historian told us, or told my mother actually, um, was that Bathsheba Sherman was either babysitting or caring for an infant in our home and that that infant died in her care. Uh, an autopsy was conducted. Uh, this was in uh, the early 1800s. And they found that a needle had been impaled at the base of its skull and the cause of death was listed as convulsions. Because of the nature of the death, 
there was an inquest conducted. Our town at the time was not even incorporated. So the county seat was the nearest town, Chepachet, Rhode Island, and there was an inquest. And basically it never went any further than that. A series of questions and interrogatories were posed. And for all intents and purposes, she talked her way out of it. Now, I don't necessarily think that she did anything to deliberately harm the child. And there is no proof or documentation, nothing in recorded history that would indicate that Bathsheba Sherman was a witch. However, the gentleman, uh, the historian that told my mother the story of Bathsheba would always hang his head when he'd speak of her. He was a very old man when we met him. Bathsheba Sherman lived from 1812 to 1885. And he was 10 years old when she died. We met him in 1971. He said that she was brutal to her farmhands, that she beat them and she starved them, and that she was a bitter, very unkind woman who had lived with the accusation of the death of this infant lifelong. And according to him, the women in town loathed her and the men would look at her with rapacious eyes because she was apparently quite beautiful. And from that stemmed the folklore, the rumor, and the innuendo that she was a practicing witch who sacrificed an infant to the devil for eternal youth and beauty. Now think back on that time. This was about a hundred years after the Salem witch trials, a little more than a hundred years. Using the word witch at that time could cost you your life. And she was shunned in town. She had a very difficult life. She had four children, three of whom died before the age of four. They are all buried beside her in the cemetery in Harrisville, Rhode Island, at the Riverside Cemetery. Only one of her children survived her. Her hus husband, Judson Sherman, owned the Sherman Farm, which, as the crow flies, is approximately a mile away from the old Arnold estate where we lived. There is no proof anywhere that Bathsheba did what she was accused of doing. And so in my writing of what I call a collective memoir, our family's story and our recollections of living at the farm, I try not to absolve her because I'm in no position to do that, but at least to give the woman the benefit of the doubt because in the court of public opinion, she was tried and convicted in life and in afterlife. Now when this film came out, some maniac, some lunatic fringe individual uh, took either a crowbar or a baseball bat to her headstone, which had been in place in Harrisville since 1885. And I immediately made a YouTube video. I was furious. Anybody that sees it will see how angry I was. And for all intents and purposes, I said this. I don't know who you are. I don't know who did this, but she does. And woe be unto you. The thing that upset my mother about The Conjuring, aside from that really ugly skirt, <laughs> which she said she would never have been caught dead wearing, she retained her sense of humor and her sense of style over the years. Um, she was upset that the film represented our family as the pagan parents, the godless heathens. Nothing could have been further from the truth. <clears throat> we were all baptized and confirmed into the Roman Catholic Church. My father was born Catholic, raised in parochial school, was an altar boy for his entire youth. My uncle Eugene served the Pope directly, Pope John XXIII in Rome, as a brother of the Sacred Heart. Spoke seven languages, one of the kindest, most gentle, loving, wonderful human beings that ever walked this planet. My mother converted to Catholicism to marry my father. And here is the bitter truth. <clears throat>
we didn't leave the Catholic Church the Catholic Church turned its back on us our priest was so frightened when he got wind of what was happening in our farmhouse that he gently but firmly asked my father to take our family to worship elsewhere and we never went back to church after that because my father felt abandoned my mother was so angry that she just swore off the religion completely and when my uncle Jean made a trip from Rome he came to the farm and dad really didn't want to talk about what was happening there he was having a lot of trouble accepting it himself so instead what happened was uncle Jean talked to my mother and about six weeks later a large black car pulled into our yard and a priest stepped out of it and he asked to come into the home and to walk the house and he did and when he was done making the tour of the home and he stopped in every room and we could tell that he was very prayerful and deep in thought and he walked up to my mother and he said I'm so sorry Mrs. Perrin this house cannot be cleansed she wept she knew that he was our last hope there was no exorcism in our house there was a seance that went so very badly wrong that it almost cost my mother her life and four of her five children witnessed what happened that night it's no surprise that the uh, Warren files did not contain the true account of what actually did happen because when my mother was infested with something so evil that it literally twisted her body into a ball in the seat where she sat and a language and a voice started coming out of her body that does not exist on this earth and her chair was levitated and she was in a split second thrown from the middle of our dining room into the middle of our parlor everyone in that house heard her skull hit the floor and everyone in our house thought that we had just watched my mother die when my father tried to race to her side Ed Warren grabbed his arm to stop him and my father turned around and punched his lights out and took a man twice his size to the floor then he told the Warrens to pack up everything that they brought into our home that night including the medium and the priest and the technical crew that was filming and the audio people and told them to get the hell out and never come back now considering that the series of films that began with the conjuring conjuring 2 soon to be conjuring 3 are to uh, edify the Warrens um, it's no surprise that that part of the truth was not told but Lorraine remembered and we talked at length about it when I visited her in Hollywood at the private screening that we attended she also said that during the exorcism scene she got very upset she said to me Ed would never have done that Ed would never have done that and the part of the film that is actually true is when he says uh, no I, I would not conduct an exorcism I am trained through the church to assist and he was so devout and so respectful of his teachers that he would never have attempted to do something like that there was no blood and gore the way that they showed it but there was love intense love in our family and that is what lifted us up people ask all the time why did you stay there for 10 years well there are a hundred different answers to that first of all my family my parents invested virtually everything that they had into that 200 acre colonial farmhouse we moved into that house never for a moment expecting it wasn't even on the radar the whole notion of ghosts and spirits it was never a subject that had ever been broached in our family nothing had ever been discussed about it we visited the house a number of times before we actually moved in and had gotten to know mr. Kenyon the owner very well and none of us had had any type of supernatural paranormal activity or experience that any of us can remember but the day that we moved in 
My father opened the back of the truck and he handed me a box, much like you saw, and said, take this to your mother in the kitchen. I walked in the closest door that I could to get warm because it was snowing and sleet and freezing rain and it was so cold. And I walked in the parlor door, took a hard right heading toward the dining room through the front hall and into the kitchen. But when I walked into the dining room, Mr. Kenyon was standing there and he was packing the last of his belongings out of the china hutch. Um, he was moving out as we were moving in. And I said good morning to him. I loved that man dearly and he loved us. And I saw that there was another man standing in the corner of the room with him. And the first thing I thought was, wow, that's an odd way to dress. And I was only 12 years old. And I thought, I remember thinking, does everybody out here dress this way? He was dressed in clothes that were handmade from the 1800s. He appeared absolutely solid to me, to the extent that as I passed him, I said, good morning, sir. And he did not respond. He was instead fixated on Mr. Kenyon, had his arms crossed, kind of leg up on the wall, and a quirky smile on his face as if he was there to say goodbye. Ten years later, the day that we moved out, he was there again. But that day, I walked into the kitchen and I said, Mom, who's the man with Mr. Kenyon? She said, there's nobody with Mr. Kenyon, honey. His son's on the way. He's not here yet. April was in the kitchen with mom. She was a wee bit of a thing and really not big enough or strong enough to carry boxes from a truck. So she helped unpack in the kitchen. Meanwhile, Christine walked in with her own box and said, mom, who's that man with Mr. Kenyon? Again, the answer, his son's on the way. He's not here yet. It was chaos. There were a lot of people coming and going from the home. So it got dismissed. And then Cindy walked in and she's like, there's a man that's dressed funny with Mr. Kenyon. And then Nancy walked in right behind him and said, there was a man with Mr. Kenyon, but he just disappeared. And that was the moment that the Perrin family went from being a normal family to a paranormal family. About an hour later, my father was standing in the dining room speaking with Mr. Kenyon and all of us were in there and all of us saw the apparition except my father. And that's when I understood not only that there is something beyond our mortal existence, which I found personally comforting, but that only the children could see him. That night, Cindy crawled into bed with me and she said, I hear voices in my room. I said, is Christine talking in her sleep again? She said, no, Chris is sound asleep. I hear voices in my room. I said, we'll crawl into bed, pulled back the quilt, and she came. I said, well, what's, what do you hear? And she said, they're all saying the same thing. They're all standing around the bed and they're all talking at once. They're saying the same thing. I said, what are they saying? And her response was the same that night as it was for every single night thereafter for 10 years. There are seven dead soldiers buried in the wall. There are seven dead soldiers buried in the wall. Cindy had a surgery when she was two months old and for all intents and purposes she crossed and was brought back and that little bit came back a very old wise soul and they came to her frequently they came to her for assistance they came to her to threaten her they came to her to fight with her and they came to her because she was a threat to them what I'm trying to tell you is that there are elements of truth in the conjuring but the truth the real whole story is so much broader, so much deeper, and so much more extensive that when the powers that be at Warner Brothers read the books and the screenwriters brought a script to them, they sent it back seven times, one time for every member of our family and said, tone it down. This will run people right out of the theater. So if you really want to know what actually happened in our home, please avail yourself. Start with volume one. I suggest that you read it as a long lamentation or a guided meditation.
It will take you on a spiritual journey that will change the way you feel and think about everything for the rest of your lives. And I leave you with this thought. Be not afraid. There is nothing. If our family could go through what we went through over the course of 10 years, and by the way, I truly believe that we were meant to stay in that house for 10 years. And then 30 years later, when I picked up a pen, it was time for me to tell the story because we had had time to process what our family went through. And in that amount of time, the world matured spiritually. You know, there was no such thing as ghost hunters in 1971. This was a taboo subject nobody wanted to talk about. Nobody. Um, the pr I was a goody two-shoes straight-A student and the day that my principal dragged me into his office and put me up against a wall and said, shut your mouth. I don't want to hear one more story coming from any of your fellow students about what's supposedly going on in your house. You're a liar. And if I get one more phone call from one of their parents, you will be expelled. Well, I followed directions well, and I shut up for 30 years. And then a bell went off in my head in August of 2007. And I turned in my resignation at a job that I loved. I walked away from the theater company of Rhode Island. I packed up a U-Haul and I moved south to be with my family because I knew that I had to be with my family to tell our intimate family story to the world and tell it organically, tell it authentically, and tell it with heart. But the important thing is that my mother came back to us. I think that my mother was probably oppressed. Um, she began to dress in vintage clothing and she began to speak in a way that was archaic use of language. She was doing a lot of historical research on the house because once she realized that the house was haunted, she said, you know, they're not just passing through, they're attached to this property in some way, shape, or form. But she had a moment of epiphany. She was waif-like. I mean, she was as thin as a rail. She was just going downhill. My father was frantic, trying to get her to go to a doctor. Um, and one night, uh, I had to become like a third parent. I was about 15. And it was uh, about 11 o'clock at night. And she came out of her bedroom. And she said, honey, I'm hungry. What did you make the girls for dinner? And I told her I made beef stew. And she asked me if I would go into the kitchen and warm some up for her. Well, I was delighted to accommodate her because it looked like my mother was starving herself to death. And so I got up, put my books aside, walked through the closed down. The house was shut down for the night. The dining room was dark. I went through the dining room, through the front hallway, into the kitchen, into the pantry. And it was well before the days of microwaves. So I had to pull out the pot of stew and pull out some of the stew and warm it on the stove. So it took me a few minutes. Meanwhile, so I was a good 150 feet away from her through several doors. Um, in that amount of time, she reached into the wood box to take one large piece of wood to throw onto the fireplace uh, for one last for the night. And as she was putting the screen back in front of the fireplace, she uh, heard laughter behind her. And she turned around and looked into the dining room that was now brightly lit with oil, lamps, and candles. Uh, a hand-hewn oak table that was not ours. Uh, there were two benches on both sides of it. The fireplace that had been sealed for more than a hundred years was wide open. There was a fire raging in it. There was a woman standing over it, stirring a pot of stew. And there were children running around the room. And the woman told her children to take a seat at the table. On the other side of the table, there were two men and they had pewter steins in front of them, which was indicative of the 1700s. Um, 
One of them looked into the parlor and he saw my mother standing on the hearthstone and he nudged the man behind him, beside him, and pointed my mother out. And they were seeing a ghost. They thought she was the ghost. She thought they were the ghost. And that's when it made sense to her that we were living in a portal and that the, multi, the, the dimensions had crossed. So they were looking, essentially, they were looking into the future to see her while she was gazing into the past. Um, and that's when she was able to finally wrap her mind around it. Uh, but I'll tell you, we had to ask to leave the farm. I thought volume three would be the easiest of the three books. I thought I'd been through all the hard stuff Volume three was the toughest because extricating ourselves from that farmhouse was far more difficult than any one of us ever thought that it would be. And it fractured our family. Nancy refused to leave and to this day is angry at my mother for forcing my father to sell that farm. She went to the abutting landowners who bought the place after my father approached them and gave them a very sweet deal. And she said, I'm not going to Georgia with my family. I'm staying, and I'll stay on as the caretaker indefinitely while you do whatever work you need to do to the farm. And she did stay for quite a while. And our family never lived under the same roof again after that. Um, half of us never wanted to leave. I was among them. And half of us never wanted to look back. My mother has never gone back to the property. She never will. Uh, my father and I have gone many times. We've both had some very intense experiences. And I dare any of you to ask Nancy what happened when she and my sister Cindy ba went back in 1996. That's a part of volume three, too. We thought that when we left the farm that we were leaving the spirits behind and nothing could have been further from the truth. Profound attachments were formed and have persisted lifelong because when you are touched by spirit, it is a door that opens that can never be closed again. And you can turn your back on it and you can pretend that it doesn't exist, but eventually something is going to reach through and tap you on the shoulder and make its presence known. And we've all lived that way lifelong. I'm not afraid of anything not anything, because if we could get through what we went through, anyone can defeat anything from the other side of the perceived veil that is trying to make its mark on us as human beings. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I thank you all very much for coming. Any questions, please.